begin momentarily. Okay. All right, so we're recording. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Herbert Duran. I'm the Director of Education here at ART. Um, and welcome to today's uh, webinar, Beyond the Ordinary, a Paranormal Archive, with our guest speaker, Rice University's Head of Special Collections at the Woodson Research Center, Amanda Falk. But before we get to today's exciting presentation, I just wanted to uh, promote some upcoming art events. This Saturday, September 28th at 12.45 p.m., a tour of the EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop and Archives. And then in October, New York Archives Week is happening from October 16th to October 23rd. Uh, check our calendar for all the events all around the city. Um, and on October 17th, we have the Digital Symbiosis Archivist and Technology so our symposium and award ceremony, which will take place in person for the first time in five years at the Gotham Center for New York City History. The committee, uh, which I'm a part of, has been working very hard to put together something really special for everyone. So I hope to see you there. Um, and again, please check our events page on our website for um, additional information. Um, some final housekeeping items. Please note that this event is being recorded. So if you wish to turn off your cameras, please do so now. We ask that everyone silence their microphones for the duration of today's talk. Please include any questions or comments in the chat box. We will have time at the end of the session to answer them. You will also find a link to view the Archives of the Impossibles website in the chat box, in addition to other art-related items. Um, so back to the show. Amanda will be discussing uh, the Woodson Research Center's mission to preserve and share significant collections related to paranormal experiences. Collection highlights include the papers of Jacques Vallée, a French-born American astronomer and computer scientist whose work inspired Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, as well as an oral history collection of interviews with leaders in the field of ufology and supernatural studies. And then I just wanted to say that a few years ago, I came across the work of Dr. D.W. Pelsulka and her book, American Cosmic. Um, and I kind of went down this rabbit hole and listened to a bunch of her interviews and uh, uh, lectures on podcasts and YouTube. And one of the videos I watched was that of the Archives of the Impossible Conference, where she was on a panel. Um, and that's how I got introduced to the work that you all are doing. Uh, so with that being said, Amanda, please uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Herbert, so much. Um, I appreciate the introduction and thank you all for the invitation to talk with you a bit today about the archives of the impossible. Um, so my name's Amanda Fokey and I am a certified archivist and a digital archive specialist. And I'm the head of special collections known as the Woodson Research Center at Rice University's Fondren Library. We're in Houston, Texas. We are a small to medium-sized repository. We have six full-time archivists here, plus a program manager for the Archives of the Impossible. Um, so our department is responsible for rare books, for Rice University archives, and for cultural heritage materials that cover topics relating to um, Houston and Texas, and now also the cosmos through the archives of the impossible. Um, so I was I want to give you a kind of an overview of the collections and then also tell you a little bit about a deep dive that we're trying to do, especially with two of the collections right now to provide um, broader access to them in a way that we couldn't uh, if we didn't undertake this this project. So um, here we go. All righty. So um, I think this link is going to be provided to you in the chat. This is 
the library's website that organizes information about the archives of the impossible. Um, there are 15 of these collections. Overall, our department has, you know, close to 2,000 collections. So this is a portion of what we have. It's a really fascinating portion of what we have, and it's really of great research interest. Um, the 15 collections are very different from each other. Uh, some of them range in size from just a few boxes to 150 linear feet. Um, and you may be wondering, do we have pieces of UFOs? No, no, we don't. We don't have any physical nuts and bolts sorts of um, evidence of, of that kind. This is more um, an archive that that has some, you know, pulled together some published materials, uh, both rare and less rare, but then also a bunch of what we'll call experiencer narratives. And I think that um, it's a very special combination to have both of those. Um, so some of what we have in the collections here at, at sort of a bird's eye view are federal court case records and other federal Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, so FOIA requests um, made by UFO and UAP researchers. So um, unidentified flying object, UFO, um, unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAP. Um, they might be published articles, journals, books, news clippings, video news footage. Um, but a, a lot of the other materials are individual researchers files, like case files. Um, and there are original photographs in there of, of UAPs and hand annotated maps of sightings and short interviews with witnesses. Um, and those really are fascinating. I've only just begun to become familiar with those. And so I have a lot of exploring to do Additionally, though, two of the collections literally have thousands of letters from individual authors um, who are ex experiencers in one way or another. So they had an experience with a non-human intelligence or um, seeing a craft or having some kind of a dream that they um, have been troubled by and believe could have been an experience. Um, and they all date from a time before the internet and they're from all over the country um, and in some cases the world. And they were generally written in the 1980s and 90s. Um, so they're really, really interesting. These people have had no connection to each other. Um, they're just individual letters written to these two individual people, the donors of these collections. Um, so whatever you think of the experiences that they're sharing, don't you want to know if there are patterns in all those thousands of narratives that came from all over the place? Um, at the very least, we know that these letters and narratives have some um, characteristics which merit exploration. And our aim is to make them accessible for research. Um, archival access makes the exploration possible. And then it's going to be up to researchers, of course, to do the um, meaning making from the collection. OK. Um, so one question that comes up often is, are there other collections like these around? Uh, certainly, yes, there are. And they're you know older than the collections that we have. Um, in some cases, you know, so at the University of West Georgia near Atlanta, um, they have a significant archive there that focuses more on parapsychology topics. Um, near to us in Texas, there is the Anomaly Archives in Austin, um, which isn't related to uh, part of a formal institution. It's kind of an informal archive. Um, and then in Sweden, there's the Archives for the Unexplained, which has a really robust, uh, rare publication library. And they, they also have photos and films there. Um, so there are collections around, definitely. I've only named a few of them. 
Um, if you're interested in particular about UFO related archival collections, I'm showing you here information about a publication that came out this year by um, the science librarian, David Leftig and um, his co-author E.S. Uh, Kukier. And so they really did some deep dive research about specifically UFO related archival collections. And that's worth a, worth a look. Um, and it does show that Rice has a, um, a bigger chunk than any one other entity of this kind of collection, but that there are similar collections um, in a lot of other places, so. Okay, so you may be wondering um, why impossible? Why is this collection called the impossible and how did it get here? So it was named by Dr. Jeffrey Kripal here at Rice University. He is um, in the Department of Religion and he really is the reason that all of these collections came together here at Rice. Um, his research areas are comparative method and theory in the study of religion, history of religions in America, paranormal currents in the history of science and popular culture. So that last, well, all of all of these relate to his interest in what we're calling the, the impossible here. Um, even bigger picture at Rice, I, the Department of Religion, um, you know, a lot of what they're exploring is how humans see themselves in relation to the cosmos. And so that's how this kind of study could fit into the Department of Religion. Um, so, but... This book that you see in the middle, Authors of the Impossible by uh, Dr. Kripal came out in 2010 and the one on the right came out just this year. Um, in 2010, I'm gonna read this quote. He, he says, I published an intellectual history of the paranormal entitled Authors of the Impossible. The conceptual matrix of the paranormal, it turns out was not born in the tabloids or in a science fiction novel but in some of the most accomplished scientific personalities and elite academic institutions of the European and American academies in figures like Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution with Darwin um, and around institutions like Cambridge University, Harvard University, particularly around the psychologist and philosopher William James and a bit later, Duke University around botanist J.B. Ryan. By an author of The Impossible, I meant something specific and radical. I meant an author who writes about well-documented historical events and common human experiences that are not supposed to happen, but they clearly do. And who, by writing about these impossible things in an especially powerful way, renders them newly plausible, imaginable, thinkable, in a word, real. So I mean authors who make the impossible possible. So um, because Jeff Kripal has been working in this field for many years now, he has a lot of colleagues who are also interested in the same topics. And so conversations with some of those colleagues um, and their research archives and their interest in building legacy for their careers via archival placement, um, that's how it all came together at Rice. So one of the really nice things that we have in partnership with these collections are oral histories with the donors of the archives. Um, they started coming in about 10 years ago um, and some time was spent with processing and starting to make them available. And then around the time of the, um, the pandemic, um, we decided it was a perfect time to do some Zoom oral histories with the donors. So the person you see pictured here is Jacques Vallée. Um, and he's one of the, he had one of six oral histories that we have with the various donors of the collection. Um, and those are findable in that link that was provided in the chat at the beginning that starts with digitalcollections.rice.edu. You can see it there on the screen. 
Okay, so I thought I would show you a few examples from the collection so you can get a feel for what kinds of things are in these collections. So this one is uh, related to physical mediumship. It is the Stuart Alexander collection, and he is a physical medium who is based in the UK, not far from London. Um, in 2010, he published a book called the, An Extraordinary Journey, The Memoirs of a Physical Medium. And he hosts a website where he describes himself as exploring survival of the human soul beyond death and tangible communication between two worlds. So his gift is about eight boxes, eight linear feet of um, some news clippings, some correspondence, um, a lot of books and journals. And then primarily though, what it is, is audio recordings of his seances. So we have digitized all of those. We haven't transcribed them all, but that could be a really interesting um, group of material to do a deep dive with. Um, so we're we're looking to go as a next step to do the transcription, but it's, it is um, hundreds of seance recordings and also some of his public lectures. And Jeffrey Kripal's papers are here as part of the um, Archives of the Impossible. And it's really, you know, his correspondence, unpublished manuscripts, course materials, ongoing research. Um, he does put copies of his email related to these collections in his archive here. So, you know, I said a little bit about his interests. I will, you know, add to what I said that he's interested in the study of comparative mystical literature. American countercultural translations of Asian religions and the history of Western esotericism from Gnosticism to New Age religions. Um, this collection is not really processed yet, but um, but it will be. We had been kind of letting it build up to sort of a critical mass before we processed it. Um, but we're excited for that. It's got great material in it, of course. Um, this is a view of a folder from the Edwin C. May um, Laboratories for Fundamental Research Papers. And this is one of the bigger collections. It's about 54 boxes of materials, uh, 54 linear feet. Um, this one relates to remote viewing. And so I'm going to talk about well, what is that? I had not heard of that before I started working with this collection. Um, but Ed May, so he started his career in the 60s as a nuclear physicist. Um, and then in 1975, he started working on parapsycho parapsychological research um, being undertaken at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it was during the course of his research that he really got interested in this topic of parapsychology. Um, and then he started working at Stanford Research Institute as a full-time senior research physicist and got secret security clearance. And at this time, he began his work on the federally funded classified research into extrasensory perception being conducted at the Stanford Research Institute. Um, so this project would go by several code names over the years, including Grill Flame and Stargate. Um, <clears throat> so it has memos, correspondence, uh, videos of early experiments. Um, it was classified, but it's been unclassified. So it is a collection of unclassified data, but also like additional you know, correspondence and handwritten notes and experiment recordings um, and drawings and uh, things that really show how they did this research. Some people use the term psychic espionage to describe what remote viewing is, but the reason they were exploring this was because uh, this was very Cold War time, of course, and um, they were training people with extrasensory perception talents 
to um, make drawings and try to say where this, like describe this target. Another person in the experiment would have the target and the target might be like literally a photograph of a known place in the world or just sort of a general landscape or it could be some non sequitur collage. Um, just for, that would be just for training purposes. But um, so the point was that um, they were trying to get researchers with those um, extrasensory perception talents to be able to pick up on a location where something important was happening, maybe on the other side of the world. Um, so that's what this is about. Um, and the collection really shows like the level of um, success or the level of challenges or things that didn't work out. Like it's really fascinating. And it's really one of our heaviest um, used collections here. Um, back to parapsychology, there are the Stanley Krippner papers. And um, he was a professor of psychology and a founding faculty member at Saybrook University in California for over 50 years. And he also was um, in Brooklyn, New York at Maimonides Medical Center. Um, he was is he is still living. He is a pioneer in the study of consciousness. He's conducted research in the areas of uh, dreams, hypnosis, shamanism, um, disassociation, um, often from a cross-cultural perspective and with an emphasis on anomalous phenomena that seem to question mainstream paradigms. So this is like 20 boxes, a big run in chronological order of everything he ever wrote. So this one, it's not so much that it's super rare because he published so much and it's out there, but it's so convenient to have his entire career gathered together like this. Um, Brenda Denzler, her collection really is primarily an insight into how the media presents um, UFOs and aliens and topics like that. So it's not um, research on cases. It's really a look at the media's um, perception of it and how they describe it um, in their work. It's primarily the 1990s and 2000s. Um, another very large collection, the Larry Bryant collection, um, he worked in the military for a number of years in writing roles, um, like, um, he was the civil service staff writer, editor for, um, army news. Um, he worked at the Pentagon. He himself didn't have UFO type encounters or experiences, but he was really, really fascinated with it. And, um, he, for many years, did a lot of like heavy lobbying of the government to release what information that they had. And so his collection is really evidence of his career trying to get the government to release information. So some of it, like you see, that's a news clipping, but a lot of it is um, Freedom of Information Act requests. This one, the Richard Haynes collection also relates to UFOs, UAPs. Um, Richard Haynes is still living. He is an American psychologist who worked for NASA for many years. Um, and since the 1980s, he got really interested in the study of UFO phenomenon. And after he retired, he dedicated a lot of his time to this topic. Um, he also was a collaborator with Ed May, who we've already talked about here. Um, and so, but really what his main interest is, is uh, UFO cases that have involved pilots of civil and military aircrafts that have seen unexplained phenomenon. So in 1999, um, the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena the acronym for that is NARCAP, N-A-R-C-A-P, um, was created to accumulate reports like this. And, and Haynes was a chief scientist for NARCAP. 
And so what's here are, um, his collection is about 17 boxes of materials. So there's a lot of like reports and correspondence and such, but um, it's really a very interesting collection of these original interviews that um, don't appear elsewhere. Um, so this is another collection. It has been digitized. It has our identifier number on it, that Haynes-003. Um, they weren't all in great shape. This one has a, um, a very informal sort of like damage note on it. Um, so this is really a fascinating collection, definitely. Another collection, this is one that we haven't processed yet. Um, but this is Paola Leopizzi Harris's collection, and this shows the cover of her 2009 book, Exopolitics. Um, and she just published a book with Jacques Vallée entitled Trinity, The Best Kept Secret. Um, so stay tuned. We haven't processed that one. And then the Jacques Vallée papers. So we're starting to get to some of the, the bigger collections that we have that Jacques Vallée's papers are about the size, same as Ed May's, you know, 50-ish boxes. This one is restricted by Jacques Vallée's request for 10 years from the date of donation. Um, and he has made donations in several groups. And so the first group from his collection will be made available to researchers in 2025. So, we look forward to that, but what you can see in this box here is um, these are case files with with his names for the case files. Um, and as Herbert mentioned during the introduction to our time today, um, Jacques Vallée started his career as an astronomer and he co-developed the first computerized map of Mars for NASA in 1963. And now, if if you're into these topics, you probably recognize his name from lots and lots of podcasts that are out there. Um, but and he is an author, uh, ufologist, and still a, a, an astronomer. Um, and his papers were the first ones to come here, so they really are the cornerstone of the archives of the impossible. Um, they have background files on cases. Um, social trends, cults, related phenomenon, scientific topics relevant to ufology, um, correspondence with fellow researchers in this area dating from the 1950s to the mid 2010s. Um, so people are gonna be very excited that they're gonna have access to at least some of Valet's papers in 2025. And now we come to Ann and Whitley Strieber's papers, which relate to, um, primarily they relate to the letters that he received in response to his book that you see pictured here, Communion, A True Story. So um, Whitley Strieber had an experience in his cabin in upstate New York with what he calls the visitors. And he described that and published his description of it as this book, Communion, A True Story, in 1987. And he worked with a forensic artist to convey what the visitors looked like to him in the form of a drawing. And that is what you see as the book cover. Um, and so this book, you may be familiar with it. It came out, as I said, in 1987, and it was a bestseller. And what happened is that people saw this book, read this book, heard about it, and they sent him thousands and thousands and thousands of letters from all over where people were saying, oh my gosh, I had a similar experience. I have to tell you about this experience that that I had. I have felt so alone not have, I, and people would think I was crazy if I told them this um, experience that I had, but um, I have to tell you this. And so all these letters from all over the country, you know, dating from the 80s, 90s, you know, some into the 2000s, as you can see, sometimes they also include drawings of what people saw. Um, 
So in just in the Streber collection, there are almost 4,000 letters of this kind from individuals. Um, and so this collection is open for research and people do come and sit and read these letters. It does include personally identifying information of the authors of the letters. And so um, the arrangement that we have settled on with Whitley Streber is that it's okay for people to come and read the letters, but they're not allowed to publish the names of the authors. Um, so that's an agreement that researchers have to um, agree to. That is still feels kind of problematic. Um, and so I'm gonna talk more about that in, in a moment. Um, another collection that we have, I just, um, as of the past couple of years is the John E. Mack collection. And he, he was a um, Pulitzer Prize winning author and a Harvard psychiatrist. And he was conducting research into the phenomenon he referred to as uh, as alien abduction. Um, he died unexpectedly in an accident in London in 2004. So his work was cut short and his archives of all of it had, had been stored in Boston. You know, he was employed at Harvard at the time. Harvard wasn't always really delighted with the nature of his research. And there was a time when they tried to um, have him fired from the university. And so in his legacy with his archive, his archive is split between Harvard University and Rice University. Har Harvard University has the portions of his career leading up to this kind of work with the experiencers and that part of his career is here at Rice. Everything leading up to that time is at Harvard. Um, it is a large collection. Um, Harvard's collection is not available for research yet and neither is ours. Portions of his collection are going to are restricted and portions are not, they just are not processed yet. Um, but like the Streber letters, in the Mac letters, there are, I mean, in the Mac collection, there are thousands of letters from people writing to Dr. Mac because he was running a research study as a psychiatrist to work with people who had had these kinds of alien abduction experiences or some kind of encounter with a non-human intelligence. Um, and the reason that they were so interested in working with him is because he had a reputation for not pathologizing people immediately who came to him with stories like that. Um, while it is true that some people would be coming with stories like that who were suffering from mental illness, but not everyone. And so with his um, skills as a psychiatrist, he would um, try to recognize those situations when they were happening. And um, generally speaking, his research focused on um, people who had been determined by him not to be suffering from mental illness, but to really have had this experience and needing help coping with their lives since they had that experience. You know, um, it could be a very isolating experience for people because um, it's not easy to talk to just anyone about an experience that you had like that. Um, there could be trauma involved with the experience. Um, it could have also been a positive experience. It just runs the gamut, you know. Um, so what's in his collection are letters that people wrote to him to try to connect with him and also to try to participate in the research. Uh, and then also there are recordings and transcripts of all the session transcripts where he's working one-on-one -on -one with the um, experiencers. Um, and he referred to them as co-researchers. So you can imagine that is incredibly sensitive and not at all appropriate to um, make open for research um, anytime soon. Really, that has a for sure a 50 year uh, restriction on access to it. Those people could still be alive. Again, this was primarily in the 90s. 
some in the 80s, um, early 2000s. Okay, so intriguing characteristics of the Streber and Mac letters. Okay, we're going to start our little deep dive into um, trying to provide access more broadly to these collections, Streber and Mac, because they're so fascinating. It's an enormous group of letters, like over 7,000 original letters written by individuals, you know, just reviewing. They didn't have any connections to each other, and they were from all over the country. Um, and it was in a pre-internet era. Um, and they have been archivally preserved with direct provenance from the letter recipients, Streber and Mac. Um, and they do appear to share some commonalities. I mean, you just can't help but notice that when you're um, processing these letters. The image that you're looking at here is a portion of a drawing that is that came with the letter that you see in the um, in the bottom left. That's from that's from a Streber letter. Um, and just to show, you know, are there patterns or not? You know, it's interesting. There are there is like drawings and art in the collections, and one of these is um, from the Mac collection, and one of these is from the Streber collection. So you can see like there are definite um, commonalities that are would be very interesting to explore. Okay, so some of the challenges, living authors uh, possibly. So there are privacy concerns there. There are some donor restrictions that we've talked about, um, but there are also like in really, really intense donor interest in sharing the information. It just needs to be done in an ethical way. Um, there are There is intense like researcher interest in accessing the information. Um, and there is an enormous volume of information. So enter the planned metadata research study. So um, this kind of feels like we're trying to build this plane while we're flying it, to use that analogy. I mean, we are engaging in um, a rigorous planning process, and we're starting with just a pilot. But it still is um, unfamiliar territory for a lot of us who are involved in this project. But uh, you can see on the bullet points here what we're trying to build. Um, for this volume of sensitive data, could we provide it online in an anonymized way? Um, that remains to be seen, but that's what we're trying to do. So um, the picture on the left is Whitley Streber, who visited here this summer, and we were looking at some of his collection, his letters together that feature drawings and art, and that's um, Dr. Jeffrey Kripal on the right, and they're standing in our reading room here in the archives. And um, we were just kind of having a um, deep dive session with Whitley Streber to talk about the nature of his letters and how he and his wife, his late wife, and um, handled them when they received them. So, um, we did spend some time talking with the Institutional Review Board at Rice. Um, we have a number of project mentors. Um, if you're going to put this put this recording up, I'd like to put their names um, in the description for the for that. But we certainly have um, advisors that come from the IT realm, the research planning realm humanities realm um, and like brain science realm of a, a variety. Um, okay, so I had I had said before this research study, like it is large volume. I'm just kind of putting the numbers out here. Um, it's a lot of material. For, for us in the archives, this is large scale. For big data and other uh, disciplines, this is not big data, but for us it is. Um, 
So this is an example of a letter written to John Mack where I've put yellow boxes over the portions that would need to be redacted. Um, I'm just giving a moment to, to look at that. Um, lots of times people, you know, they had limited space writing to John Mack. They had to, they couldn't go on and on. Their letter could only be one to three pages or so. Um, you know, that was their, their request. And so people would sometimes, um, say just a portion of their experience and then um, say, I'll tell you more when when I hope you contact me. Um, and this is a piece of an experience described in a session transcript with John Matt with portions on it that would need to be redacted. And you can see here, okay, like, so we need text recognition for all these things. Um, and this is a mix of printed text and handwritten text and underline things that cross through words. I'm sure all of you have experience thinking about, you know, text recognition in some form or another and see the problems here. Um, so anyway, first it had to be digitized and because it was sensitive, uh, the donors wouldn't allow that it go off to a vendor to be digitized. So we did it in-house. Um, we had some pre-digitization steps where we removed staples and like put the folders in the box sort of akimbo like this and preserved the clumps of documents with those um, file folder inserts, you know, so that it would be possible to send them through a, a sheet feed a document scanner if they were not fragile and then they went on a flatbed if they were fragile. And then this was kind of our process of showing that a box had been scanned and it was ready to put into our um, cream colored archival boxes and on the shelf. So it's digitized. The Mac collection is digitized and so is the Streber. And now we are working on developing our secure computing environment. We're doing pre-processing of the PDF documents uh, which means like removing noise documents, um, admin cover sheets, you know, there's just some noise. It's documents that aren't talking about experiences. Um, we're doing text recognition. I'll show you a little more about that. And then we will wind up doing some training of an AI model only using our own data. So, um, this is a very text heavy slide that I won't read all through, but you can see that we're trying to move from um, on the very left-hand side where we're talking about our project protocols, um, non-disclosure agreements for those of us working in these sensitive archives, um, city certifications that relate to IRB and human research, human subject research. Um, and systems like using our um, remote access, duo authenticated access for where the files are. So really all the like human and machine environments to make this a safe um, environment to work with this regulated data. That's how we're treating it. And then it winds up on the right side uh, being preserved for the long term in our digital preservation system here at Rice. So the transcription work, you know, we have discrete groups of content, um, Streber letters, Mac letters, Mac transcripts, and um, we're using the software tool Transcribus, um, the large language model that they have called um, Titan. So our text is not being um, recognize at, our text is being recognized by their large language model, but it's not adding to their large language model or being used by Transcribus in any other way. So this is an example of Transcribus handwriting recognition. So a lot of it, it really does pretty good, pretty good. And they would claim that their character recognition accuracy rate is um, 
97%. Uh, we plan to do some testing to see if that's what our results were with their model. But you can see here the highlighted line on the left and the right that they don't quite match up. The person on the left is trying to say, I could hear in my mind someone, and that's not what you see on the right over there. I could hear on my and someone, not the same thing. Um, this is an example of printed text, which you would think might be um, pretty good, but you can see the nature of the inconsistencies here, you know, like right above the highlighted line, it says the, the validity of UFOs and on the right, it got that. But then just a little bit below that, um, it says the word UFO again, and it didn't catch that. So there's going to have to be some human correction of the, the AI. Um, so just a quick note on IRB and data security planning. Um, we did talk with the IRB office here at Rice and they did say that they don't classify this work as human subjects research in the IRB definition of that, um, that we are preparing data for research by others. Um, and the data security plan is a separate concern relating to ethics and appropriate um, safe project planning. So that's a whole other thing we could talk about all day. So I won't um, linger on that. There are also, you know, environmental impacts to using AI. All of those things are being discussed and thought about. Um, so upcoming fall 2024, our plan is to have cor human corrected tagged text files that can then go in an AI environment. It would be using a Mongo database to organize metadata about the files um, and TensorFlow as the platform for the AI work. Um, we would be trying to follow HIPAA safe harbor guidelines for the anonymization work. And what I mean by that are you can um, find these HIPAA safe harbor guidelines online. And this is these things that you see here are examples of what kind of data types they would expect to be excluded because they would be um, things that you could combine to identify a person. So if you look at that, elements of dates except the year, okay. Um, phone numbers, fax numbers, that's okay. Email addresses, we don't wanna include that. URL, social security numbers already. But the geographic data smaller than a state or a zip code except for the initial three numbers possibly. You can see that like we're, we're gonna be having to balance excluding information that would identify individuals, but also preserving enough so that the meta, the information that we're able to analyze is still useful. Um, so these are just some details about, you know, the long-term preservation of the data, uh, that it would be moderated um, by human access in our archive staff. Um, I'm sure we'll publish on this once we get further along in the project uh, with more detail. So again, these are the kinds of possible end results we're looking for. Um, we want people to be able to get a feel for what kind of narratives are in these collections and then possibly uh, they can ask their own questions of the data. And um, we're starting there. But then questions going forward, um, because some of us in our team are familiar with how AI works, but they're not yet as familiar with um, this, the content. And then other of us, others of us are more familiar with the content, but not how AI works. So like as a team, we have a lot to learn together to put our thoughts together about how to safely do this. Um, and we're interested in the, the role of art corroborating accounts between experiences. So there's going to be a like a visual um, version of this where you can 
see all the drawings pulled out individually. And that'll be very interesting. Um, as Herbert mentioned at the top of the talk, there, there was a conference here at Rice that was streamed online. There are YouTube playlists for these two conferences that happened actually. So there was one in 2022, and that really is focused on describing the archives um, as they stood at that time. And then um, in 2023, as you see here, it focused more where scholars were coming from around the world, you know, and talking about transnationalism, transdisciplinarity, and transcendence in relation to these impossible topics. Um, and then we're having a conference in April of 2025, so stay tuned. That will again be at Rice University and um, streamed online. But I think that the top, the lens of that will be religion. And then in the future, there will be one that is art, but I'm not in charge of that decision. That will be for Jeffrey Kripal to say, um, but it is currently in the planning and there'll be information about it online soon. Okay. So that is what I had to share with you today. I was trying to leave a little time for um, questions, if you might have questions. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was amazing. Um, but yeah, so the let's get to the Q&A because we don't have much time, but yeah. I kind of also had a similar question along uh, this with the vocabulary, you know, the switch from UFO to UAP or these new, you know, terminology that non-human intelligence stuff like that uh do you employ a specialized vocabulary for subject headings and finding aids or individual digitized documents uh, i can't imagine lcsh is up to the task but maybe i'm wrong that's such a good question and um so not not really not yet um i think one of our weaknesses in our department is um you know really really having like deep subject headings for finding aids um but now that we're getting down to item level digitization um of the these materials and especially in these two collections we're going to have to um make our own internal controlled vocabulary for them because that is going to relate to the tagging so we want to do human correction of the machine created text recognition and while we're in there doing that apply some tags in order to train the large the language model that we're building so those tags are like their own little um controlled vocabulary great um someone else asked will the group of valet papers become accessible or the, the ones becoming accessible in 2025 be digitally available as well not to begin with, they will just become physically available. Um, the guide will say what's available. And then we do a lot of um, remote research assistance. So if people see a file in the Jacques Vallée papers that are open and they want to ask for a PDF copy of something from a file, you know, we certainly can do that. We do that all the time. Um, there, there may be, there may or may not be copyright concerns with like just putting it out there publicly um it depends kind of folder by folder what's in there does it make sense what you know to do that um the nature of valet's papers are are lighter on the side of things that are already out there published you know a lot of it's his own work and so um you know, we'll be talking with him about what he's comfortable with in terms of our putting it out there publicly. Okay. Um, and do you have any newsletters or other mail-based pre-internet community building materials that may have brought experiencers together? Would this be of interest within scope of the collection? Yeah, we do have um, boxes and boxes and boxes of um newsletters and journals that are like community driven, you know, some of them are big, more well-known groups like MUFON, um, but some of them are less well-known, you know, and so we're working on cataloging those. 
Um, so that is an important part of the collection. And we don't currently like have plans to digitize those. You know, again, there could be some copyright concerns with doing that and putting those online. Um, but in the digital collections.rice.edu link um, to the archives of the impossible that was in the chat at the top of the hour, there is an icon you can click on there to look in our catalog limited just to the impossible publications that have been cataloged. But there are many, many more things that haven't yet been cataloged. And do you think that there are different privacy standards for archives versus private companies? It seems the latter collect pretty much everything on the HIPAA list. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, um, I guess what I would say to that is that we feel very beholden to trying to operate it in an ethical manner. I don't know. <laughs> It would vary from um, corporation to corporation about how they handle sensitive data. But for us, especially having read a lot of these letters where people are really kind of terrified of anybody finding out that they're talking about this experience having happened to them, like you really have to respect their privacy. Okay. And I hope you and uh, I, I don't mess up any of this vocabulary in this next question, but are you able to talk more about why training a model from scratch versus using a pre-trained LLM, which seems to be more the trend along with RAG approaches, retrieval, augmented generation. RAG is able to query against a fixated, fixed data set to pull specifics in a way that is less prone to so-called hallucination. Yes. We have talked about using a, a rag um, and that's like, I, that is not my wheelhouse, but we certainly have been talking about like wanting to use our own data as, um, as the lar large language model. So that, to try to reduce the amount of hallucinations because of that step. And as you're saying, using a rag setup would further reduce that. Um, so we do plan to implement tools like that. And, you know, it really will be something like a topic for another day, all the all the technicalities. But if you're interested and want to ask me questions about it after this, like, please do feel free to email me and I will answer as best I can or ask our programming specialist who's participating in this because that's his wheelhouse. Cool. And I think we have time for one more. Um, you mentioned one of your donated collections includes email. Is that delivered digitally? It's going to be. So So what we have, and I mentioned that in relation to Jeff Kripal's papers, and there are some printed emails from a previous donation several years ago. And, and Dr. Kripal is ready now to do another branch of emails to donate to his archive. And we have since developed familiarity with the EPAD software for um, email archiving. And so what we would wanna do is take his email account in inbox format and um, use the EPAD tool to slice and dice the portions that he wants to archive and then preserve that digitally, yes. Okay, all right, I think that's, that's it. Um, thank you again, Amanda, for uh, participating in this. Um, everyone be sure to check out the digital collections uh, at, at the Impossible Archives. Um, and in relations to art, please look at our events page for our upcoming programming. Um, hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.